that, that song um, really took me to a, a scripture that, um, that's in, in First Peter. Um, it says, Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Isn't that what we have to look forward to as believers? Amen. Amen. So, um, so that song was Kiyoka's new single. And um, isn't it great that we have, um, she can do her single here for us at Harvest. Amen. So let's give God some praise for Kiyoka and her team. And um, wonderful scripture um, unveiled in that song. Well, good morning again. Let me add my welcome to you. Uh, my name is Pastor Al, and if you are a guest with us today, I wanted to just say personally a, a special welcome to you. And um, we love Bibles here at Harvest, so if you need a Bible, please go ahead and raise your hands, either a Bible or a sermon outline, and our ushers will be happy to get a Bible to you. Um, we usually read here from the ESV, which is the English Standard Version. Really easy to follow, really easy to read. So we'd love for you to be able to do that. Um, so just raise your hand really high. They'll get a Bible and a sermon outline into your hands. Um, this morning, I am going to be coming out of our Act series, and I'm going to, this morning, be doing a single sermon on church membership. Now, I, I, I often wonder, and this is a question for all of us, why is church membership important? Okay? And I'm sure that many of you have asked that question before. Why is church membership important? And I want to ask, and I also want to answer that question for you today. So many of you attend a church, and many of you have been attending here, right? And you don't know, and to be quite honest, some of us are uninformed as to what the Bible has to say about the importance of church membership. So we want to be able to unpack that today. And we're going to ask and answer the question, why is church membership so important? And for those of you who are joining us online, uh, welcome. And I trust that you will be able to follow along with us as we um, unravel and unpack God's word today. Now, um, why is church membership so important? The universal church, the body of Christ, is composed of, listen to this carefully, true believers in Christ. And local churches are a microcosm of the church universal. So as believers, we have our names written in the Lamb's book of life. So once someone gives their life to Jesus Christ, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and no one can blot it out. Okay? That's what Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12 tells us. And it is that important that we catch this. It is important to commit loved ones to a local church where we can give of our resources, serve others, and be accountable. So I want to focus, I want us to focus on that this weekend, right? As we turn to several scriptures, so today there are probably about three scriptures that we're going to be looking at to help you see those truths and help to answer the question, why is church membership so important? We want to see them, we want to understand them, we want to embrace them, so the goal is for you to embrace them for yourself, right? With the hope that, listen to this, everyone look at me. If you are not a member, you will be one. You will become one. And if you are, the goal of this message is to kind of stoke that fire, to, to, to encourage you, to, to fire you up all the more that you have already committed to becoming a church member. So the first passage that I want us to look at this morning comes from 1 Peter. So if you will, turn with me there to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, right? 
This is the first passage. And what happened? Peter has just concluded telling us, right, that in the midst of suffering, right, um, it's all good. And we've been studying that even as we've been studying the book of Acts, right? And then he says here in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1, so I exhort the members, the elders among you. Every, everybody got your eyes in scripture? All right, so let's go. So 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1, so I exhort the elders among you as, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. In other words, what Peter is saying to us here, loved ones, is that I have credentials to be able to tell you what I am about to say to you. I have lived this. I have seen this. I have experienced this. This is what he's saying. So look at verse 2. Listen to this. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you exercising oversight not under compulsion but willingly as God would have you not for shameful gain but eagerly look at verse 3 not domineering over those you are you those in your charge but being an example to the flock underline the word flock shepherd the flock be an example to the flock, he's saying. So the question is, who's the flock? It's a good question, right? Coming right out of scripture here, who's the flock? Who is it? Who comprises the flock, right? Who are the elders responsible to shepherd? As in, when we talk about shepherd here, as in lead, as in protect, as in provide for, you can't say that it's people who just attend. Because not everyone is a believer who attends a church. Everybody agrees with that? Right? And the church, the flock of the great shepherd, is, is not only comprised of believers. Nor can you say it's all professing believers who comprise the flock. Because... Not all are really professing believers. As a matter of fact, Matthew 15 and verse 8 tells us this. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's what Jesus said. So there are some, let me, let me break it down for you. There are some who would come to church and they would sing. They would raise their hands. They would say, well, I am praising God with my lips. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the, the heart. So he knows. Okay? Which means that we need a way of identifying what the true flock is, who the true flock is. A way to determine who is and who isn't part of the church. And loved ones, that's exactly where membership comes in. Write down this one, number one. First thing I want you to see here. Membership is a necessary means of identifying the flock. And that's what 1 Peter 5, chapter 5 verses 1 to 3 tells us. That is the first truth that without a formal membership and without a formal membership process... It's often impossible to know who the flock is, this flock that Peter is referring to here, especially in larger churches where elders don't even know everyone. And to be quite honest, elders can't know everyone in a large church. When we get to a church our size, I met someone in step one last week who told me that they've been coming to harvest since August. And I had never seen the person before. Right? So when a church gets to a certain size, as elders, we can't know everyone. So membership becomes a necessity. Providing a means of identifying the true community of the redeemed. 
for whom, understand this, the elders are in charge and we are responsible for. And apart from which, they are just left to guess. Inevitably missing some or focusing their efforts upon those only who they know and leaving out the rest. Neither loved ones of which is good and both beg for something better. So when we enter membership, we ensure to the best of our ability that someone is a genuine believer, relying heavily on their testimony of faith, relying heavily on the fact that they have already given their lives to Christ and they are baptized, right, willing to follow God in the waters of baptism to identify, right, with an, it's an outward sign of inward regeneration, and their desire to live under the authority of God's word. And willingness to make a commitment to our church. Just like the ones that we see, for those of you who are members here, just like the ones that we see in the membership commitment. Have any of you ever seen that membership commitment? Right? Commitments like maintaining a consistent devotional life. Like being in worship as in prioritizing worship attendance. If you are a member of a church, you prioritize worship attendance, right? Actively building the church up, right? Speaking well of one another because you realize that the person sitting next to you is not just a stranger, but the person sitting next to you is a member of your family because they are a member of the family of God. Are you following me? So this is how important membership is. And things like tithing, giving above, giving above your offering, right? Tithing to the local church. And in addition to their testimony and life, those things help to determine that they are indeed part of the flock and therefore worthy to receive the right hand of fellowship as Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9. You know, when I, when I saw this phrase, right hand of fellowship, how many of you have ever heard that phrase before? Right? The right hand of fellowship. Yeah. So what does that mean when it talks about the, the right hand of fellowship? Um, it, it's, a, it's a biblical phrase and it refers to the approval and the affirmation of the elders that a person is part of God's family and welcomed as a member. And as such, it's the closest reference to formal membership that we have in the Bible. Used then, just like now, it seems here to identify the flock that Peter is talking about here. And that's the first truth of, of, um, of a church that's built for this. That, listen, the first truth is that membership is a necessary means of identifying who the flock is. So as elders, if you are not a member, if we don't know who you are, how can we shepherd you? How can we care for you? How can we reach out to you? Here's the second thing. Membership is a tangible demonstration of a spiritual reality. And this is what 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 tells us. The spiritual reality, first of all, that having embraced God's free gift of salvation, we are members of the body of Christ. Or as Paul says it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And what Paul, what the apostle Paul is doing here, he's using metaphorical language this is a this is a metaphor that paul uses here to show that while we are unique and different we are also connected because if as the flock if as members we are members of the body of christ the local church then there is a connection just like parts of the body it's a spiritual reality and membership in a local church is a tangible demonstration of it. An outward means of reflecting what is an inward truth. 
that while we are all different, we are all connected. We're connected to each other because we are members of the family of God. And that's how important it is. So it's a tangible demonstration of a spiritual reality that the hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. Right? So in the body of Christ, we need each other. Don't we? We need each other. Turn to the person next to you and just tell them, I need you. Here's the third thing. Membership is a public expression of personal commitment. Romans chapter 15 verse 1 through 6. A personal commitment to each other. Right here because the letters of the New Testament loved ones were written to local churches. Groups of believers just like us gathering here. And we're studying that now as we study the book of Acts, right? Urging us all, and here's the first sub-point I want you to write down. Urging us all to love one another. First John chapter 3 verse 11 says it explicitly. We should love one another. In verse 23, not in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Meaning, among other things, that we should put the interests of our church, our brothers and sisters in Christ, ahead sometimes of even our own. And when I'm talking about church here, I'm not talking about the institution. I'm talking about who comprises the church. We, we, we do, right? It's the people. The church is the people. Church is not the building. The church is not the institution. And that's what this is talking about here. It's, it's sometimes loving one another that you put the interest of another person ahead of your own. Now, is that easy to do? No, it's not, right? But this is what the Bible commands us to do. Right, And if we don't, it becomes detrimental to the church and detrimental to you and detrimental to others. Now, listen, even if we break fellowship with a church, right, a love for Jesus means a love for his bride, the church, and doing everything that you can do to honor her and, and, and preserve her and to protect her. It's part of committing to love one another. So you do nothing, uh, listen to me, absolutely nothing to try to destroy the church. Absolutely nothing. So, so if the church is a place that you say, well, I, I can't come here anymore more, and I need to go to somewhere else, well, well, by all means, go. But do nothing to pull down and drag down and destroy the church. Absolutely nothing. If you are, you are destroying the very thing that God loves. He calls the church his bride. So membership is a public expression of a personal commitment to love one another. How are we doing at loving one another? We doing okay? You guys feel loved? Your love tanks are filled? All right, scale of 1 to 10, where's your love tank? Where's your love tank? Right? 1 being the lowest, 10 being the highest, where's your love tank? 8, some people say 8, that's great. That's great, that's great. Um, here's the next thing. Membership is a public expression of a personal commitment to belong together. And that's clearly, and we've been studying this in the book of Acts, Acts 2.42, who devoted himself, and he says this, um, or committed themselves to fellowship, belonging together in mutual partnership. It is a commitment that guards our hearts against, listen, a lone ranger mentality and spares us from the aches of loneliness. So listen, membership is a public expression of a personal commitment to belong together. So that you don't try to live your Christian life on your own. 
a lone ranger mentality. If you have been coming to harvest for any time, you will know that we don't believe in the lone ranger Christian thing. I stay home, I read my Bible, I pray, I watch TV, and I'm good to go. Nonsense! Not even biblical. Not biblical. Get it out of your minds. Get it out of your heart. Listen to me. It's a trick of the devil. There is nothing called a lone ranger Christian. Well, I can do this thing all on my own. It's me and God, me and God, me and God. Really, the devil will eat you and he will chew you up and spit you out. Here is why. Because membership is a public expression of a personal commitment to belong together. The reason, and we're studying this through the book of Acts right now, the reason that the church was created, that God, remember he said, it's better that I go so that I can send a comforter. And he says, listen, I want you to go out and form the church. If he wanted the disciples to do their own thing, he would have said, 12 of you, just this first, and go do your own thing. No, that's not what he says. So it's important that we belong together. Amen? Here's the third commitment, to bear with, with one another. And for this, I'd like for you to turn to Romans chapter 15 and verse 1. Everybody turn there with me. Romans chapter 15 and verse 1. Everybody got it? Good, I love hearing... Those pages turning. Romans chapter 15 and verse 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Isn't that a good verse? We who are strong have the obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. You could easily write next to that word to persevere, right? And that will just nail that verse right there. Meaning that we have an obligation to persevere in the church, to bear with people when they're difficult, to stay the course when they fail us, to hang in there when times are tough, to stick with it when you're disappointed, even when you are disappointed by your leaders. It's a commitment. It's a biblical commitment. Listen to me carefully. To bear with each other. Here's the fourth commitment. To build one another up. Build one another up. Romans 15 and verse 2. Look at it there. Let, us, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus not only took the sins upon himself, but the accusation of sin was placed upon Jesus Christ. And he did so for two reasons. Here's the first reason. To build us up. And the second reason is to serve as our example. That we will do the same. That we will build one another up. And this not only qualifies to your neighbor, but it qualifies to the person who's sitting next to you. And that person sitting next to you in the church should be top of your list. People with whom you worship, people with whom you do ministry, people with whom you do life. It's a commitment every, to every single one of us. And we should make this publicly, expressing this publicly, helps us with good intentions and engaging to build one another up. Here's the fifth one, to live in harmony. So after saying that scriptures were written for our instruction, endurance, and hope, Paul says in Romans 15, 5 and 6, look at, look at it, um, 15 verses 5 and 6, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, in harmony with him, that together 
you may with one voice glorify God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a prayer, isn't that? That's a prayer of sorts. God give them the peace and unity that you desire in the church. Give them the harmony that's so attractive in your people. Something that God will no doubt want every single one of us to do. To yield ourselves to him. And to commit to doing the same. Can I ask you? Are you living in harmony with each other? Are you? To the best of your ability, are you living in harmony with each other? Because that's so important for us as a church. To live in harmony. To have unity among us. Amen? Listen. God's glory departs from a church that's divided. The word is called Ichabod. When God's glory departs. And let me tell you, I sit. And I wake up sometimes early in the morning. And I'm down on my knees. I'm flat on my face. And I pray, God, help Harvest Bible Chapel to never be a place that your glory departs. But here is how it starts to happen. When there is no harmony among God's people. So as much as you possibly can, live in harmony with each other. Because remember, the church is not the, the bricks and the, 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 the columns and the speakers and the, 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 the truss. It's not that. We are the church. And if we don't live in harmony with each other, God's glory departs. Here's the next one. To serve one another. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Use it to be all that you can be in the work of the ministry. Use it to stay off of the sidelines. Use it to bless those around you. It's a commitment. And publicly expressing it is a way of saying, not only that you can count on me, but, but I want to be counted on. I want to be counted on. I want to be involved in God's work here. As I possibly can to the best of my ability. I will give of my best time, my best talent, and my best treasure to serve the people of Harvest Bible Chapel. Listen, a few years ago, there was a young lady who came to our church. She went through step one, step two, and step three. She became a member. I will tell you, that young lady has been such a blessing to my family. Hmm. There are times that we will get a call early in the morning. Pastor, what are you doing for breakfast? Uh, I'm still in bed. Look outside. There's a jeep parked there. We'll go outside and she'll serve breakfast to my entire family. You know what that's doing for my kids? But not, not only that, right? Not only that. <laughs> oh boy. She, she has a business. And one of part of her business is renting vehicles. So there are many times that my Jeep will be done. You know, and I, I, can't, I can't get kids to school and my pastoral duties. And, you know, she will say, you need a vehicle? She will send someone to bring a Jeep to my house. Drop it off. And then at the end of it, I said, well, how much do I owe you? No, no, nothing. It's like, what in the world? Who created you? You're just so different. But you know, you know I, I think of that, right? And I think th there is someone who gets it when it comes to serving others and supporting others. And let me tell you this, right? I know she, that she not only does this for me and my family because I'm the pastor. But many of you around here, you know exactly who I'm talking about. 
And it's no status thing that I am the pastor. She does it for every. She opens up her home on a weekly basis for small groups to meet there. So I'll tell you something, right? On a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you think I love that girl? Yeah, so it's off the charts. No, here's, here's something I'm, Debbie and I were kind of wrestling through, right? So when we were choosing the people to go to Georgetown, you want to give Georgetown the best of your people. And I'll tell you, when her name was the first on the list, and I wrestled, man, oh my goodness, can we send her? She was the first on the list to go to Georgetown. You know why? Because when you're planting a church, you want persons to come alongside you who understands what it means to build one another up, to live in harmony, to serve one another, to support one another. I ask you, how are you doing? How are you doing, loved ones? How are you doing? And that's the seventh commitment. It's to support one another. And that's what Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 says. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So fulfill his ethic, his way. His way of treating one another in the church. Listen, weeping with those who weep. Helping those in need. Supporting one another in the trials of life. How are you doing? Listen, God has given us at Harvest an incredible ministry because we have people from all different walks of life, from, from many different cultures coming to our church. Have you invited them to your home for lunch? Have you reached out to the students that God has placed in our care? Have you reached out to them? Have you loved them? Have you cared for them so that they, when, when these students leave the, the shores of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they can go, listen, I went to a church and I tell you this church was off the chains. Remember the church is not the building, the church is what? The people, because those people were loving, they were caring, they were living in harmony, they were serving one another, and they were supporting one another, and they supported me. So I tell you, love them, care for them, reach out to them, feed them some good Vinci food. And then the last of the four truths here for a church that's built for this is membership is a valuable means of sanctifying our lives. A valuable means of conforming us more and more into the image of Christ. That and the, at the end of the day, loved ones, it's not about us. See, it's not about our church. It's not about the membership in it. It's about exalting Jesus in our lives. Both individually and collectively. And membership goes a long way towards that. For these three main reasons. Write these down quickly. It, it reinforces our need to recognize and imitate our leaders. The writer of Hebrews... When he's starting to wind down here in the last minute with these instructions, he says in verse 7, Remember your leaders, those who speak to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Remember them as in recognize them in the first place. Keep them in mind. If you don't recognize that you have spiritual leaders, let alone that you need spiritual leaders, then your sanctification, loved ones, will be lacking. We need spiritual leaders in our lives. Every single one of us needs a spiritual leader. We need people who are gifted and godly for the purpose of discipleship and guidance. That's how God designed the church. And that's how he made us. We need it. And one of the benefits of membership is that it reinforces that need. It calls it to our attention. It's a formal way of saying, I need to be led, and I need to be led well. Here's the second thing. It tests our willingness to submit. Hebrews 13, verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with groaning, 
for they would be of no advantage to you. Membership is big for leaders in the church because it clarifies exactly who we are responsible for. And it's a big deal for the rest of us because it tests our willingness to submit and obey. So some people would say, I don't ever want to become a member because I don't want people to know my business. I don't want people to pry into my life. Then I'm here to tell you you don't want to grow in your walk and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because it tests our willingness to submit. Now, submission is not a word that any of us like. It doesn't come naturally. But all, every single one of us need it. I need it. I am in submission to our elders. You are in submission to our elders. We need each other to submit because that's what helps us. And membership is a valuable means of sanctifying our lives because it tests our willingness to submit. And then thirdly, it holds us accountable to the biblical standard of behavior. Something that every single one of us needs. Everybody, look at me. Here's something that every single one of us needs. It's called accountability. Accountability. Every single one of us needs it. And, and membership provides it because it's an open, open invitation that says, Help me! That's what it is. Help me. Help me grow. Help me stay away from sin. Help me get out of sin. Help me know the joy of my salvation. And help me do whatever it takes to honor God in my life. It's an open invitation to be held accountable to God's standard of living. That's what membership does. Not that we are being moral police. Going around. Boy, how she living her life. Boy, how he's living. No, that's, a, that's not what I'm saying. But it just helps to, to keep us accountable. Worthy of our calling. Worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And membership is about that kind of accountability. And such, it's a valuable means of our sanctification. So as I said from the top, if you are not a member, I hope by now that God would have impressed upon your heart the importance, if you've been coming to Harvest for a long time, to become one. And I hope you will add to yourself the living stone to the household of faith that God is building up right here. And if you are already a member, I hope that you will be encouraged by what you've heard and spurred on even more to love and to good works. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the design of your church. Thank you for the setting up and the building and building it up and providing for it the things like membership. Help us as we live this out. Give us a passion to pass it on for a church that's built for this. We now come, God, to the communion table for that very reason. So that often, as often as we eat and as often as we drink, God, we will do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen.